us versus them or anything. I'm just kind of getting that out in the open right now. Um, where I'm from is, again, Fairfield Medical Center in Lancaster, Ohio. We're a small community hospital um, in southeastern Ohio. If you don't know what that means, that's kind of on the border of West Virginia. No West Virginia jokes, it's just we're near Appalachia. But unfortunately, we're about 30 miles southwest of Columbus, which is in the center of the state. So geographically, we're located in an urban area. So we get paid by the government urban-wise, and yet we compete with other hospitals that get paid Appalachian rates. So you're going to learn a little bit more about healthcare than maybe you ever did before today. Um, 50 to 60 percent of most hospitals revenue. Sorry. Oh, was it recording? I can start all over again. No. Um, okay. Um, so 50 to 60 percent of a hospital's income will come from Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement because you know all the boomers are hitting, and that's where all of the money comes from, basically. So you get paid by your, the ability of your clients to pay. So if you live in an area that's more poor, then you get paid a little bit more because they want you to stay in business so you can keep taking care of folks. Well, we have to compete with the city hospitals, but all the people that come into our emergency room don't ever pay. We lose three to five million dollars a year in our emergency room because they come there rather than go to a doctor's office. We're a nonprofit hospital, which means that we have to actually prove that we're taking all the money that we're not paying in taxes and giving it, you know, providing all these other services and that sort of thing. We like to say three to four percent net operating margin. I've been here since 2004. We've never made that much. Um, for us, that starts off with about 200 million that we bill. By the time you get through with your contractuals, you're down to 100 million. We're just trying to make three to four million dollars a year that we can invest in our company. These are IT people. Our data center is falling apart. Um, I have a data warehouse, but the application server breaker keeps tripping on and off all the time. Um, our floor is rated for 60 pounds per square foot. Um, it's sagging. Um, we don't have enough power for our UPS if everything goes down. You know, the whole, the whole deal. So, so we're just trying to get things turned around, and we've kind of started to do that. Um, for healthcare, how many in here have had a recent healthcare experience, either yourself, a loved one, somebody you know, anybody like that? Have you known anybody that's been in the hospital recently? Okay. Did you, do you have your own horror stories of, oh, this didn't happen and nobody knew that this was going on and all that type of stuff? Or do you happen to go someplace where everything worked perfect? Okay. <laughs> With all these medical advances that we've had in healthcare comes what I call increased specialization, meaning I'm the liver guy. Not only am I the liver guy, I'm the enzymes in the liver guy, right? And I don't need, I don't care that you know your back hurts and you can't do what I tell you to do to take care of your liver. And nobody's looking out for the patient big picture wise. We're all very, very, very specialized now. So we've had all this decreased holistic medicine, if you will. Well, because of that, you have all these people going, this was a terrible experience. The government's saying it. Um, the insurance companies are saying it. Watchdog agencies are saying it. And so what they do is they go out and they start regulating the hospitals, right? They say, well, you know what? You need to prove that you gave the aspirin to a heart attack patient on arrival within 24 hours. Or they say, you need to make sure that you gave the beta blocker within 24 hours of discharge, or all these types of things. And then they start to say, hey, you have all these more and more reporting requirements. So there's some examples there, the aspirin on arrival, the beta blockers, I could go on and on and on. And they call this transparency, okay? This is supposed to be better for the patient, right? But it's hard, hard, hard for the hospital. It's just trying to get by because this is voluntary, right? Okay, it's voluntary that I can show to the world that I got check marks instead of red X's or whatever and all that stuff, right? It's voluntary, but you looked at my bottom bullet point here, but we're going to pay you based on how good you do there, okay? So you can see what some of these things are on here. This is just a surgical care infection program. Um, each one of these uh, core measures might have multiple measures, and they're coming out at a rapid rate. Some of that. But anyway, this more recording or reporting means that um, there's much more data and information that the hospitals need to know. Um, you have multiple similar and constantly changing requirements. What I mean by that is that I could represent the government. You could represent some insurance company. The insurance company will say, well, the government has some pretty good regulations, so I'm going to base my stuff on theirs. But you know what? Four hours doesn't matter to me. I think six hours is good enough. 
So then I got to go figure out how to report, you know, generate my file for the government. Oh, they're all in different formats and they got to go to different people. And everybody in healthcare is very, very technically challenged. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but teaching somebody how to copy and paste from their spreadsheet just to do like some kind of a control chart in your statistics package, I mean, it's just not going to happen. It just, I mean, you try and do it, you try and do it, you try and do it, you try and do it. A little bit more background on myself. I got into this because I got out of the Army in 2004 and I didn't know what I was going to do. Because in the Army, you got to stay up to a certain day and then it's just like fly away and be free. You know? You got to go someplace. <laughs> and, um, and so I didn't know what I was going to do. And I tried to find something that I would be happy with. It felt like I was contributing and making a difference. And my career counselor before I joined the Army kind of knew this person who worked at the hospital who was our chief medical officer. And they were just starting a Six Sigma program. So I'm looking at all the stuff that I'm talking about here today from a process improvement kind of back, back point. But process improvement kind of, um, how can I say it? It assumes that you have some basic knowledge of inductive and deductive reasoning and maybe science and maybe a little bit of math. And we like to think that healthcare is science-based. It might be at that specialist level who's looking at his enzymes but it's not science-based for the people who have worked in a community hospital for the past 30 years, you know? And you know what? They might have worked there for 20 years and they're, left, they're younger than me because they started when they were 16 and they never left. That's the type of place that I work. And, and so we have them frustrated by these time-delayed results algorithms, meaning that if I have to report my data to the Joint Commission, I have to do it through a vendor. I can't just send them my data directly because, oh, I might fudge my data. So I'm legally required to send it to somebody else to send it to them. Well, when I do that, they get my first set of data, and then a month later, they send me back some stuff that says, oh, here's what you have to report. So then our folks sit in going through rings and rings of paper to get the answers that they need, send it off, and a month later, they send us the answers back. So three months later, we know that we failed. And the people that we have in the hospital don't know how to find out whether or not they failed on their own while they're looking up through this stuff. And that's what I'm here to talk about today because it's too late three months from now if we're going to get paid for performance to know whether or not we passed or failed our algorithms. So here's just an example. Here's a small sample of the bookshelf of just a few of the measures that they might have to report on. Um, these all come in big, giant stacks of paper that they print out. These are very detailed algorithms. First, thou shalt look in the medical record at the anesthesia record and look for these 15 things in this order and either one of them might be your surgery start time and it's in order and that's how you get it. And none of those times that are written down by somebody on hand, by the way, match anything that's in our systems. So you've got to run whole projects just to get what's in your system to match what's on the piece of paper so that the computer can bring it out for you. So. Is this a business opportunity for someone? I mean, you would think so. There's the McKessons, the Boston Scientifics, the Siemens, the Meditex, all these people dropping what I call these huge monolithic systems, boom. And I had some conversations with some folks today and they said, well, these aren't good systems because nobody gave them good design specifications. And that might be true, but the people in healthcare don't know how to tell them what they need. You know? So I feel kind of lucky to be in a position to go, oh, I can see some of the things that are really wrong, but am I the one that's good enough to know how to write some of the stuff to fix some of the stuff or whether you should do it? Or, I don't know. But there's a lot of no customization allowed, or if you might say too much customization allowed, where they write these huge um, domain-specific languages to build your screens, to build contract management things to help you decide stuff out. And can those people use those systems? No, they really can't use those systems very well at all. So I kind of look at this as a static versus an organic thing. They drop this big thing on it. Most of the people in healthcare use maybe 10% of the solution that you give them anyway because they don't know how to get to all the other stuff or they don't know how to figure it all out. And really, you kind of need to start from the ground up in healthcare and build what they need as they need it so that they can kind of do that. And once in my mind, I'm going ding, 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 ding. Okay, four years ago, I learned about small talk, and I'm like, oh, this is exactly everything that you're talking about. You build as you go, you get what you need, you work on what you work on. And that's a natural fit for how I and the one other, I don't want to say smart person, but the one other technical person that can talk to people in my hospital kind of works is that we go out and we try and build these little solutions that live in our own little world and you know what, if they get blown away because our server 
that's a, you know, a Pentium 4 under our desk, and if we kick it too hard, the power goes off, and now we're not spitting charges out to a bill for two days because we didn't know it was turned off. Well, that's kind of how we tend to work. But so that's kind of where we are there. So the reality check is that we have organic processes in healthcare. By that, I mean everything is a special case to a healthcare provider. When you have to work with these users, I mean everything is, well, this way it works this way, but if it's Tuesday, we do it this way. And, if it's, and so as a science IT or a, a process type of person, you're like, well, then just change your process, right? I mean, as an example, I don't know, I'm going to have to start keeping track of my time here. How much time do I have? You know, um, as an example of a process that um, my biggest money-making project is a Six Sigma Black Belt, we went and tried to reduce the cost of a surgery case. Sounds simple enough, right? Go measure how much the case costs and what you... Okay, to measure the cost, you have to know the cost. To know the cost, you have to know what you used. To know what you used, you have to know what it's called. And that sounds real simple, but we went into you know rooms and we took our little trash bags and we gathered all the wrappers from all the stuff that got used in the case and we took the circulators, the people in a surgery case that actually record this stuff on sheets during a case and we had them all count all this stuff. And they counted it all up and nobody got the same answer. Our gauge r and for this was like 100, 300 percent, something like nothing matched anything because, oh, it's an adaptive dressing. No, it's a non-occlusive dressing. But in the database, it's whatever it is, you know. It's a one and a half inch needle. It's a one inch needle. It's a whatever, whatever, whatever. So we built a barcoding thing. So to get back to the monolithic thing, I didn't know small talk. I knew Visual Basic. I built them a little thing that worked the way that they wanted to work. It wasn't how I wanted to write it because that was too hard. Um, what they wanted was, when they pack the case, they scan everything in. When they go in, then the cart goes into the room, and then as circulators leave the room quite frequently, because what's on the pick sheets, which that's a whole other story, but there's a sheet that gets printed that says, here's what you should pack for this case for the surgeon. But it doesn't match what the surgeon really uses, because they keep it up to date now, because they're too busy taking care of people, and they don't have good processes and all that type of stuff. Right? So, they run out of the room frequently and get new items, and they can scan it in the room, or if they're in too big of a hurry, they can open the wrapper, drop it into a bin, and when the cart leaves the room, then they scan the wrappers and they scan what came out, and the computer does the math and says, hey, here's the list of what you used, go put it into the computer. So, we did all that. Um, now, our big um, enterprise solution from McKesson, there's no McKesson people in here. Okay, good. Our big enterprise solution, they say, well, we do barcode scanning. Well, their barcode scanning is a web application that many, many screens from where they are actually documenting the case. They got to get into the part where they would document supplies in the room. And then it's nothing but a keyboard wedge. So they better be in the right place on the screen or else they're just going to zip something into the middle of their documentation or overwrite some other field or whatever, right? We did a serial port so that we could just catch the input in the tray app and just record it without ever, you know, corrupting all that stuff. And they require you to put stickers on everything because, you know, the barcode needs to match what's in our enterprise solution for our materials management system, right? Whereas we taught it how to read existing barcodes if they existed and all that sort of thing. But so those are the types of processes that you're dealing with and when I say organic. And again, the technically challenged workforce that doesn't know it's possible. So they need people like the people in this room, not just to be able to provide solutions, but to be able to to think outside of what they know and to dream for them and say, oh, you could do this, you could do that, what, you know, would this be helpful? And so that's what we try to do. Um, we do have minimal development staff, though, by that it means, well, I'm kind of our development staff and there's one, on, one other fellow. And, uh, and we have somebody that if we really kind of give her detailed instructions, she can, you know, she can kind of do those. And when I say it makes you want to cry, I met somebody in Columbus, Ohio, when I was first getting into the small talk stuff. And he worked in another hospital with another 400. And to quote him, he said, yeah, when you think of all those people printing out all those green bar reports, typing it into Word, copying it into Excel, putting it into PowerPoint, sending it to somebody so they can put it back into Excel. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes you want to cry, doesn't it? <laughs> and so I've never forgotten that from him. And that's the gap that we face in healthcare today. Here's modern data retrieval in healthcare. Those are some, uh, you know, there's our data storage. 
there's our data retrieval. I work on the I, I work on the fourth floor across the room from our QA folks who have to abstract all this data to send all these regulatory agencies. That's one of their parts right there. They have a little bin, you know. And so they gotta go all the way downstairs, they gotta request these things ahead of time. I forget like twenty-four to thirty-six hours ahead of time so they can get their medical records to bring them up. Because we don't get judged based on what's on our system that we can pull. When people come in and audit to see if we've gotten the data direct, uh, correct, they actually look at the chart and they follow the algorithm. So if what's in our systems doesn't match what's in there, you know, we're, we're kind of screwed up there. Uh, here's modern data abstraction. They actually do go through these charts and they put the stuff into there. Um, unfortunately, the, um, to go back to another project that we ran right when I first started Six Sigma, um, it was for core measures, and we were just, we did better than we thought we did, but we couldn't prove it. We didn't document it well. So, you know, be, me being me, right when I got there, and they didn't have anything else but access, I wrote some access forms, you know, they're typing the data in. I actually got with the people, the vendor that we have to send the stuff to, and oh, they had a file format, so if we could produce a file from this, we could send it to them, so they didn't have to do it on the website too. But they forget that, and then they go in and they, put it in our system and they put it in the website and then they put it in somebody else's website and that's just what they know how to do this type of stuff in the websites. Um, so they do that sort of thing and, and they do a lot of it. So why am I saying this whole thing about domain specific languages? Well, the, the thing that always catches me on this is it's targeted to a specific problem. I have a very specific problem um, and I need some customized answers. The idea of an external custom full parser isn't for me with my limited development staff. And, you know, and I've seen the, the pitfalls of that with these other products that people come in, yes, I'm going to build the next great thing that people are going to use to build these algorithms, and I'm going to be the one using it, right? They're not going to be using it. And then when I get hit by a bus, nobody's going to be using it, and they'll be back to putting the stuff on the website and getting their answer three months from now. So my whole premise of coming up and saying, hey, help me out, I'm here, you know, I came here to meet people to get some more ideas and stuff, is that small talk in itself is kind of, you know, you can build these internal kind of small host language translation things for the types of problems that I have. So for another example, let's consider that we have to report that, um, you know, our antibiotics were given within 24 hours prior to some surgery and that we discontinued it within 24 hours after surgery. That might be to the government, say, or it might be to LeapFrog, or it might be to somebody or somebody or somebody. So these different regulatory bodies might have met very many different definitions of what is a valid antibiotic. So my list might be different from your list, different from your list, or they might be called different things, or you know, all that sort of thing. So you gotta somehow translate all that. Um, their idea of a start time might be different. Start time might be incision time, or it might be when you enter the room, or it might be whatever, and you somehow have to manage all that. Stop time the same way. Um, and then they might have acceptable pre and post time durations, like 24 hours is good for me, but for Anthem insurance, 48 might be good enough or something like that. So these are just examples. I'm not up to date on all my algorithms, so I might be saying things that aren't exactly true, but those are the kind of tweaks that you face. Um, the other big major tweak that you face is just who your patient population is. So if I'm the government, I might say that it's everybody who got a lap coli, but my definition of a lap coli might be different from somebody else's definition, that sort of thing. Um, Excel is the most prevalent, what I would call business domain specific language out there, especially in healthcare. This is what everybody uses to pass their data around in. But, um, so it's more prevalent than any efficient tool that you can use to suck the data out. So we do a lot of linked tables to spreadsheets, you know. But then when they change the name of the column, that doesn't work too well. Or when they decide to move it around or all that sort of thing, it just doesn't work too well. But to the end user, and here's the point I want to make, it's fully customizable. They can change anything they want, they can do whatever they want, and they're happy with it, but it doesn't help us with our aggregate data. Which brings me back to the organic processes thing. In healthcare, the important thing to healthcare is their record of that single individual patient. It's everybody else outside of them dealing with that patient that cares that two patients had the same care, or that out of 100 patients you got one wrong, or that sort of thing. So these big monolithic systems are forcing check boxes on our healthcare providers that then they can't go back and get the detailed record, the nuance that they want from the handwritten record that everybody can give to them. And yet we can say, oh yes, you gave them their smoking education. You found out that they were a diabetic. You found out 
you know, you recorded what their blood sugar was, all that type of stuff. So, um, so really, healthcare's idea of a of a medical record is that we will record the stuff in the computer. We'll print it out to hard copy that they can all flip through and read. We'll scan it back in to an image, and we will store that image on a server somewhere with a patient account number and medical record number so that someone can pull it up and look at the picture, which doesn't help us get any of this data and report stuff to anybody like that. So there, it's this endless, endless loop of all that sort of thing. So Excel isn't our best data store, source. So I come back to why am I here talking about small talk? I kind of think of, and this is just me, you know, and I could be wrong because, again, I'm probably the only guy with, you know, what can I say, two months of something useful and small talk under my belt, okay? So, but I kind of think of it as a generic domain specific language where I can build these classes that are internal to my problems. I can use it as is, which is kind of what I'm doing right now because I am the guy trying to write these things and get answers from it. Um, you could create custom language, you know, some even subset of stuff that you could even look at all the C sides. You could put stuff in a text box and it could go back as small talk. And being small talk, you could just execute it, right? What would that be? Um, don't somebody help me out. Compiler something. Evaluate. And there you would go. And you could execute some code and you could get some stuff. <coughs> Um, what I really need out of small talk with all the persistent stuff we heard is what I'm calling transitional data storage. Um, Brett's going to smile and nod here. In healthcare, you don't have a database solution. You have all these things that you've been buying for the past 30 years and you're still using. So we have RPG and green screens running on DB2 with non index tables that if I try and hit my 30 billion build charges from 2004, Nobody can type anything in in the whole hospital and my phone's ringing and they go, Rob, what are you doing down there? And I'm like, oh. So, I mean, what I do is a lot of every night, you know, I run little things that get me two years of build charges and index the tables right on there and that sort of thing because we didn't even have a data warehouse. We're just putting that in right now. And, um, and all I'm doing is thinking of a data warehouse as yet another data source because I'm not going to get everything I need into it. I might someday, but I'm not tomorrow. And people are still going to need stuff that's from the surgery system and from the warehouse and from the lab system and all that sort of thing. So I'm still, whether it's small talk, whether it's me sitting in access doing link tables and writing nightly jobs and whatever, I still have to be able to get the incision time from the surgery system and mix it up with their arrival time from our main system. So that's just as simple as it is right there. Um, so I'm really excited. Um, you know, mostly about the glass seaside play, because I just don't have to think about it. There are all these other tools out there, but for the new guy, all I want to do is build my stuff and not worry about it, you know, and, and then be able to export stuff nightly as a text file that can get sucked into the warehouse and get mixed with all my other stuff so that I can generate these files that go to all these different people. But um, my web interface comes back if we go all the way back to, right, here's my data retrieval. It's been hard but I think we might be able to convince them that they could go down to medical records where they wouldn't have to wait for three days to ask for the record. And if they could pull it off the shelf and we had something down there where they could just log in and use some kind of a tool, that they could enter their data right there instead of carrying it up four flights of store, you know, four flights and going back down. So, so that's kind of the web thing for us. Um, other than that, it could be just a desktop app or something like that. So on the one hand, it's not that big of a deal. Um, so then when I talk to people, they're like, oh, you need to do everything you're trying to do. You know, Dev will do a lot of this reporting stuff and everything, but I think it would be a great reporting solution. We just went out, you know, we did, you know, um, we outsourced to McKesson because we were very unhappy with them. Does that make any sense? No. <laughs> so we thought that this would be a great idea to leverage them if we could convince them that they could come in and help make us some sort of a standout facility and that we would get more from them if we actually let them be our IT provider that we were unhappy with. So I don't mean to stand up here and sound like, you know, the, but it's just the point, I mean, hospitals don't know how to think about that sort of thing, and it's not really their fault, I guess it is, but anyway. Um, but so that would be a great reporting solution if I could automate the front end and the back end. So, I mean, because I have all these other data sources, I just want to feed into it and do all that sort of thing. And I need these algorithms, which I'm going to talk about and give some examples of here in a second. Um, and I don't think they would be too happy storing all of our healthcare-related data on somebody else's server somewhere else out there. 
there. So, you know, yeah, if he would sell it that where you could buy it and you could put it on your stuff on site, and I don't know, maybe that might be some kind of a thing that they might look into someday. So I put that down as my next research project to say, hey, there is an opportunity. People would probably, I mean, it's a great tool. And if you could combine that with your, you know, data warehousing, spitting out automated, you know, OLAP cubes that could go into Dabble, and then you have all these fun things that you can do, that would be great. But in the meantime, I have our normal um, McKesson products that when I create my reports, anytime that I change my data set, it blows away all my highlights that I built on it, so that's what I'm doing. But here's what I believe. We are saying that I believe that there could be a lot better documentation tools for healthcare. Right now, people who build documentation tools in healthcare um, give them all these great tools to build whatever they want to build. So they build what they already have. They build pieces of paper that don't give them any of the information that they need way downstream to report to all these people. But they can get you any report that you want, and they'll be happy to print it out for you. So that's where you are with that. But I think, why not picture a world where documenting for a nurse, you walk in and your screen looks like a patient, right? And if I click on the elbow, there's only so many things I can do to an elbow in healthcare. And depending on the patient that I'm working with, there's even less amount of things that I can do there. So in like two clicks, I ought to be able to get to the thing that I want to be able to tell about, right? And then maybe it can remember what happened there the last time, so I only got to change what's different this time. So these are the kinds of things that could happen. But now, in our hospital, what do they got to do? They got to go through like four different tabs, three different screens within that tab, all to get to the elbow to tell it what they're doing, and then it's called something like a flow sheet, and they've got to scroll down to however far they got to scroll and over how many days and whatever, instead of just a nice little bar that would go, oh, take me to yesterday so I can see the results, right? Okay. Well, so um, I'm an ordinary person, and I need extraordinary tools, and a big part of why I want to come here is just to meet the people that are building the extraordinary tools that I I, again, devout in my belief that this is the way to go. Um, so these tools are anything that in my mind maximize simplicity and the ability to create these rules that we need to follow in healthcare because you're not going to go to them and say change your process. Change your process to match my software. That's what everybody keeps saying and it's not going to work. It's just not. What's, they're just going to keep printing pieces of paper and I'm just going to have to keep telling people well, you got to keep typing it in, right? Um, the collections in Smalltalk alone are worth it to me. I mean, if I can do an ODBC connection and get some stuff in there for the really hard things. I'll give you an example. We have chart times. Millions and millions of chart times. Nowhere do we record when somebody arrived and left a unit, but we got lots of chart times. But try writing a query if somebody came into the ICU. Everybody know what the ICU is? Really bad, right? You're hurt really bad. But then there's like a step-down unit, which we call a PCU. Other people might call it step-down or something. So you go from ICU to PCU. Then you go to a floor. Then you get really sick and you go back to the ICU. No matter how I try and figure it, if I write a query on that, I get the first chart time when they got to ICU the first time and the last one when they left the ICU the last time and never the ones in between, right? Unless I write a program. Now in small talk, okay, I'm getting down into some collections and I can, you know, give me all the ones from ICU and I can write some little thing and just a few lines of code that in my VB days, right, would have been, oh, what am I going to do? I'm looping through record sets and I'm doing this stuff. But so there, that's, that alone's worth it. All these new web-based tools give me now, okay, I can write tools for people that aren't in Morphic. Nothing against Squeak and the Morphic folks, but it's like, okay, we just upgraded to Office 2007 for like me and a few other folks. We're on Office 2000. I'm having a hard time finding where things are. Do you think the people in the hospital are going to be, we better like make some money this year, shut down for a month, and then upgrade because that's where everybody's going to be. So they understand using the web right now. They're used to putting things and navigating through forms. So we, we do like that. And all these, again, what I'm calling transitional persistence is available to us. So I'm really happy about that. The ODBC, though, you have to have it in health. I'm just, I mean, you can say, oh, we have native connections to this and that. But I'm telling you, somebody somewhere will have bought somebody's custom thing that's written in some other data. I mean, we have databases that are file-based systems that we try and hack into, and all we find is these binary files of, you know, you can't even find a pointer in, or, like a lot of the data in these things are stored in an XML thing and a free text, and, and yet it's an actual data element. If you can get to it, you can like parse it out, and do whatever, and go, oh yes, there's the time that they got their x-ray, okay. 
you know? And that's how you have to get stuff. And so you write all these nightly batch tools going through getting all the yesterday's things and working all your way through it just so you can write out a piece of information that you can suck in. So our roadmap, my phase one is just my generic web-based data collection tool that I, you know, I'm going to try and show a little bit here. And then we need to be able to preload some data because the next thing that happens to these people is you start saying, yes, we can get that for you. And they're happy with that. But then if I type in an account number, why should I have to get you the patient name when I see it? Why should I have to put in this? Why should I have to put in that? Because I know that's in the system. I look it up in the system, so why should I have to get it? So we need to be able to preload some stuff based on basically a patient account number. And then these algorithms to go all the way back to why I started talking with the regulatory things. I need to know, as they're entering this stuff in, did they pass or fail the thing? But not only did they pass or fail for the government, did they pass or fail for LeapFrog, did they pass or fail for Anthem, did they pass? And so, depending on the answer that they type in, or that gets loaded in or whatever, there's this whole subclassing, if you will, of algorithms that we need to be able to do. So, you know, there's this whole rule-based type of thing, and I was talking to Ramon, and he was like, oh, you're talking about an expert system. I'm like, no, no, I don't want an expert system. I just want the computer to know, and something that I can keep up with. You know, I did this in Access, okay, but I had to write whole new subroutines and whole new whatever, and it's like, no, I just want to subclass Jayco's core measure number five and say, you know what, LeapFrog is just the same as that, except it's 48 hours instead of 24 hours, and I could do that in Smalltalk, right? And yes, in a perfect world, I could educate these people enough to maybe have some calculated fields on my forms where I could do some little small talk and, you know, hey, this field minus this field gives me my start time or whatever, but probably I'll be the one sitting with them doing that, right? So who knows? Uh, so my demo, this is just a weekend project, right? For you, maybe. Not for me. But so uh, let me uh, kind, of, kind of show you what i got going on here. So. Um, we have lots of systems, you know, what I'm calling a data manager, just lots of different things that they have to record data for. And they call themselves data abstractors. So, you know, I went through this whole, what's my model going to look like in the end? It ended up looking just like what they have in real life, right? So, um, you know, we can build a new data collection system, right? More stuff or something like that. And, and we make a new thing. And again, this is... And I'm just going to say Ada, right? I'm going to stand up here trying to go Slovenian on you, and I'm not going to get it right. So, and, and, and Ada, um, this is what I was able to figure out as a new person. So now that I've used it, it kind of taught me small talk. So I kind of learned small talk using his web framework. Um, I think now I could probably go back to Seaside and be able to figure some stuff. It was all the HTML stuff that got me in Seaside because I didn't know HTML. But so all I needed, and I put a post out here going, oh, I just want to be able to build some forms for my user. And I got this tongue lashing about, you're thinking about the web the wrong way. You don't design GUI builder. You don't do whatever. And I'm like, all I'm going to do is add a text box. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I have this thing where we can, you know, we can add some new pages, right, so that they can, you know, group their data into different things. I'm not trying to make this pretty. Everything's going to go on one line until they get tired of scrolling down. Then they're going to add a new page and they're going to add some stuff. And I have my process improvement folks, my Six Sigma black belts, who I've been working with on this, and they're, they're happy to add a new text input field, right, that we can go in. We can change the name. We can do some stuff right there. This whole calculated thing, this was my, my idea the other night, right? Oh, I can just do compiler. What is that again? Evaluate, right? So, but I can put an account number here. And for them, you know, they might want to see an account number on every page because that's their big thing that they look at all the time. So we can show the same fields on multiple things and all that sort of thing. You know, we can add some checkboxes. Checkboxes are big in healthcare. We can add menus. You know, menus are real big so that they can only choose one thing, right? So then I had to build a little menu editor and we can add some items, you know, item one, we can add that, we can add item two. You know, and I'm sure that for many of you out there, this you're like, yeah, I can do that. That'd be really easy. You know, we can move our things up and down. We can set things to be the default item because that's real big for them. A lot of that. Um, you know, we can do that sort of thing and save this. And to them, to them, this is like, oh my gosh, because then when I tell them it's all in the database and we can get it and we can do stuff and it doesn't matter if they rename the headings, this is a wonderful thing. You know, this is the level that we're kind of working on right here. So I save this. And now, you know, I can create some new records, and we can check some things, and we can put in some account numbers, and we can do all that stuff. And this is all we need. Now, off of this, then what we need is I need to be able to take this data, go back in, and write some rules that deal with these dynamic fields, you know, 
So that's my struggle, is how am I going to bind these dynamic things, right, to these static-ish rules that change every week, every month, every quarter. Next year, we're going to have 70 new core measures that we have to report on voluntarily so that we get paid. <laughs> okay? So this is a big deal to us that we might be able to slightly keep up with this sort of thing. So, so that's, that, this is where I am, you know. And, uh, and I hope that this is an interesting problem to someone because if there's anyone out there that, you know, wants to go work in healthcare and do some stuff, I mean, everybody keeps telling me, if you can do this, and we can, like, from this, generate some reports that go to all the different people that we have to report to in the right file formats, Right there, they're like, I'll invest. And I'm like, well, okay, but, you know, I'm just trying to keep up, you know. So um, this is kind of where we are. Um, you know, um, my plug for ADA is that it's kind of based on your domain model. So in Seaside, you're rendering on your HTML all the time. Here you provide links right to your model, and then your model has a another class on top of it that has to have a certain name. So if I have a widget class, I'm going to have to have a widget app class also that knows how to draw itself and all that sort of thing up there. So that was kind of my introduction to model view controller, or at least model view. In my web experience, I call it model view design, right? If, you, if I knew anything about CSS, then supposedly I could change the way that this looked and move everything around on the screen and all that sort of thing. I'm excited about all the stuff that's going on around here, I think. Um, I'm about out of time, but I, I hope that this was an interesting tale. I hope it wasn't false advertising, like I had some kind of answer to, you know, internal domain specific language. But to me, small talk is an internal domain specific language that I can use, hopefully, that's what I'm basing all my life on right now, but, <laughs> that I can keep up, because otherwise we are just, I mean, the only thing they know what to do is hire more people to go through more medical records to enter more stuff, and that's exactly what they did just last month. They hired another person to keep up with this stuff, and they're like, Rob, are you done with this yet? I'm like, well, no, but maybe I'll go meet some nice people who will help me <laughs> figure out how to keep up even faster. So, um, does anybody have any questions or interest? Or go, go ahead. Um, as a user of DevDB, yes. this, I guess, a word of warning, uh, in the forums I have read, there are some record number limitations per application in DabbleDB. Um, you can have more than one application, but um, the record number limitations, I believe, are greater than Excel, but they're not infinite. So if you're going to explore this as a possibility for your application, one of the first things we probably better do is make sure that um, the, the limitations in regards to record numbers and, and things like that don't exceed what um, you have to do. Right. That was another good thing for doing this for us, was that we're not, these aren't big data, I mean for the manual data collection, I mean like our heaviest thing is probably congestive heart failure, maybe 300 patients a month, 10 months of data, 3,000, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so, and then this is going to leave here. I'm not picturing that it stays here and we write these whole applications that solve the world for us. It's going to go in here and every night go back out to the, go back out to the world where our other reporting tools that I don't have to maintain and everything can, you know, suck back up and drill down and all that sort of thing. So, thanks on that. James? Um, I'd like to note that there are representatives from three hospitals here, at least four people. I don't know if there's other people here but it's just interesting to me that while small talk has been, you know, big in the financial services or manufacturing or something like that, I think this is, you know, a larger representation from the healthcare industry than I've seen at one time at a small talk solution. So, I hope so. I, I mean, it's it's a business problem. We don't face a healthcare problem in America. We face a health business problem. In until those two match up. I mean, it's like socialized beliefs with capitalist payment, right? Oh, you gotta take care of everybody, but I don't know how they're gonna pay for it, but you gotta take care of them. So we have to be able to know all this stuff and do all the stuff that we just have to do. So. I saw another hand somewhere now. Oh, I just have two questions. Okay. Uh, one is, are you aware of the, that Smart Hub has an excellent connectivity to Excel and other no. No. Okay. <laughs> How did you meet uh, Yanko? 
Oh, because I was just exploring uh, my web options and struggling with Seaside and I couldn't figure it out. I was struggling with small talk in general. And so I got on there and I just started asking a couple questions. And if you, um, what was the talk that Randall did? A one man show? Well, Yonko's almost a one man show. But I'm telling you, if you, you, you know, base your questions on the time zone difference. If you get your question in at night or early in the morning, you'll have an answer by the time you go home. And I'm like, when do you sleep? I, so that's how I met him. Was it's just like every time I have a question, I put it out there, and I'm like, he. Is, I mean, he's just awesome. So now I'm a loyalist, right? Well, I'm, not, I'm never going to abort Ada for Seaside just because I have to help him make it better because he's helped me so much, kind of a thing. I don't know, but no. I mean, the thing I like about the small talk community is everybody's so helpful with each other, and that's. That's it's. So you never met him. What's that? No, I've never met him except you know just on online and doing some stuff and that sort of thing. So, but these, these guys, I mean, no, all all you folks have just been amazing, awesome. Um, are you familiar with the various other domains? Are you using Google for stuff data from lots of different places for different types? I'm thinking of both. Like financial and that sort of thing. Financial and uh, network, there's network configurers have applications that are basically just trying to get data from all manner of different and different age devices and put together. Or also cases where Scorpio is technically incumbent to do something else, but it also becomes a glue because it can be used to map this to that. And therefore, there's a certain amount of experience around that very people have. And we've looked into that and tried to ask, I mean, the big thing that we always end up into is, oh, wow, you know, Gemstone has a great solution, or Visual Bears, all this, and it's like, I spent four years trying to buy a $5,000 server instead of the PC under my desk. So I run into all these like financial kinds of things right now, so here I am, I'm using Squeak because it's free, even though we're, okay, even though Doug, Kindly help me get down to I think a 50 user license for half the price of whatever, and if I get it into capital, it's just not going to get past it this year. But maybe next year, right? You know, so ah, oh. so. But yes, I think uh, a lot of that type of thing. Basically, what we're doing is we're still doing that with just our other like smaller tools. You know, we have all these access tools that just fire up at night, run through their macros, do all their make tables, build things, and spit them back out somewhere and do that sort of thing. You know, everything that we do is based on, is it free, is it cheap, is it whatever, so. But they can hire three people to employ them. What's that? They can have the salary for three more people to, to type in there. Yeah, yeah. And, but, that's still how they, but that's still how they think. And until I can give them something to show, then it's not going to, you know, like your, your proof that this is going to be a return on investment. Unless maybe one of you want to come and tell them that, because we tend to listen to people that we pay to come and tell us. Which <laughs> so if there's somebody here that has a great solution I, and you want to come to Fairfield Medical Center, I would be happy to set you up and have you come and tell them that, hey, here's what you need to give Rob. So that'd be great. <laughs> anything, anything else?